Okay. Give it a week. Oh, I have it. Can you just give us the direction? Fourteen. Moves in spherical motion. Constant angular acceleration vector. Am I looking at the right one? Fourteen. A five kilogram. No, that that must be kinetics. Fourteen. A child rides a playground carousel. That one. Uh, at a given instant, the carousel has an angular speed of whatever. Um, yeah, so just uh, pick one, pick a direction. Um, yeah, if, uh, right. Um, any other questions? Did that one have a solution? Okay, so you're right that that it's going to be some stuff is going to be mirror imaged if you choose a different direction than I do if there's a solution, you know. Um, so if there is a solution, then then yeah, to make to match it, you have to choose the direction I did, and I don't know which direction I chose. And if there isn't one, it it just I don't care which one you choose. Any other homework questions? Okay. So last time we were talking about relative motion. Bless you. Um, and the example I did was a linkage where we had two rigid bars that were connected by pins um, and we calculated the velocity and acceleration of you know, a point at the end of the second member. Um, so let me do one now that isn't rigid body stuff like that. Uh, so let's say that, um, a passenger is jogging on a cruise ship um, according to a camera on the ship Um, the passenger's position follows the function position as a function of time is equal to 80 times the cosine of 0 0.01 t 80 times the sine of 0 0.01 t. Um, okay, so first of all, according to the camera on the ship, what does that motion look like? Do you recognize that motion? It's a circle, yep, with a radius of, if this is in meters, it's a radius of 80 meters. Um, and the 0 0.01 before the t, does that make it go around the circle extra fast or extra slow? Slow, yep, right. If you're running around a track with a radius of 80 meters, you're not doing a, you're not doing a revolution every two pi seconds, you know, and so that has to be slower. Um, and then according to camera on the shore, Um, the ship's position, 
or you know the position of that camera that's measuring the first motion. follows position as a function of time is equal to t for the x component and 0 0.05 t squared for the y component. What's the passenger's acceleration? Um, so first of all, the reason we want to know the acceleration of the passenger is because that's the skyway from kinematics to kinetics, almost always. That's when we want acceleration, that's almost always why. Um, and we're going to do this problem as, um, so we have a ground, a ship, and a passenger. And the relationship between those things says acceleration of the passenger relative to the ground is equal to the acceleration of the passenger relative to the ship plus the acceleration of the ship relative to the ground. Um, the acceleration of the passenger relative to the ship is the second time derivative of that position function. So uh, that comes out to be negative 0 0.008 times the cosine of 0.01t for the x component, and then negative 0 0.008 times the sine of 0.01t for the y component. Um, the really small coefficients there come from using the chain rule two, ten, two times. And so there's not much acceleration for the person who's just jogging around the circular path. If you're going around a circle with a, um, with a radius of 80 meters, that's a pretty big circle. And a jogger isn't going very fast. So uh, there's not a lot of acceleration. And uh, the acceleration of the ship relative to the ground is the second time derivative of the function t squared, no, t. And then the y component is 0.05 t squared. Um, First derivative of t is 1, second is 0, uh, and uh, first time derivative of 0.05 t squared is 0.1 t, um, second time derivative is just 0.1. And so now we can add these up and we get, let's see. The acceleration of the passenger relative to the ground is equal to negative 0 0.008 cosine of the quantity 0.01t. And then the y component is 0.1 minus 0.008 times sine of the quantity 
0.01 T. Any questions about the math of that? Okay, the next question I have about this example is, so question, um, why do we care um, which uh, frame of reference Um, we express the acceleration in. Um, you know, at the start, one of the things I gave you was the, well, I guess I gave the position as a function of time of the guy relative to the ship. Why not just take that second derivative and use the acceleration of the guy relative to the ship. That's still an acceleration. So why do we want the acceleration of the passenger relative to the ground and not the acceleration of the passenger relative to the ship. Anyone know the answer to that? Yes. Yeah. Um, that is, you're definitely on the right track. Uh, so the answer is Newton's laws only apply in inertial coordinate systems. What's required for an inertial coordinate system is first, the origin of that coordinate system can't be accelerating. And second, the coordinate system axes can't be rotating, can't be changing orientation. So if you have, if you have measurements in a coordinate system where either the origin is accelerating or the axes are changing orientation in time, you can't use the acceleration in that coordinate system for Newton's laws, okay? Um, so uh, there are two times, you know, these are the two times, the two ways that we're gonna have to apply corrections to measurements taken in a coordinate system. The coordinate system you can always think of as like a video camera. So if you're taking measurements using a video camera, um, if that video camera is accelerating but staying in the same orientation, we have to adjust for that, okay? And if the coordinate system, that camera is rotating, even if it's staying in place as it's doing it or moving with a constant velocity, we have to adjust for that. The adjustment, so this is the first one that we're seeing. Um, if all you have going on is that the origin of the coordinate system is accelerating, then relative motion is what you use to correct, to find the acceleration would be uh, in a coordinate system that's not accelerating compared to the ground. This one's more complicated and we'll do this later.
All right, so basically what that means is um, when I gave the position as a function of time measured on the ship's coordinate system, okay, um, it was easy to calculate the acceleration of the passenger relative to the ship measured on the ship, you know, in that ship coordinate system. But that ship is an accelerating coordinate system. We can see that from the measurement taken on the shore. And so if, if the ship is accelerating, then we have to apply a correction to it to use Newton's laws. We haven't gotten to that yet because we're still just doing kinematics. But the reason that we want to calculate acceleration is almost always to go to Newton's laws. Any questions about that? Uh, oh, let me give uh, um, an example that uh, probably makes more obvious intuitive sense. Um, so if you drop an object, uh, like if I just drop an object right here, it's going to accelerate down at 9.81 meters per second squared, right? Um, if you drop an object just as the cable of an elevator breaks that you're in, too bad, sorry. Um, but you drop it, what would you see like in your coordinate system, a, a camera that's fixed in the elevator, what would it look like that object did? It would look stationary. You'd just be like, that's odd, you know? Um, <laughs> that shouldn't be. Um, and uh, is, there, is there a force on that object? Yeah, there's whether, you know, there's always the force of gravity applied to it. So if you quickly, like, not really quickly, and you're like, I only have seconds before the elevator hits the ground, I'm going to apply Newton's second law, you know? Yeah. And so you think like, okay, there's a, there's a downward force applied by gravity. Your camera says that the acceleration is zero. So according to the camera, according to the coordinate system fixed to the elevator, Newton's second law doesn't hold. It, it's not accurate because you have a downward force and zero acceleration. So instead, to make it hold, you have to recognize that your coordinate system is accelerating down at 9.81. Apply relative motion equations. Then you know that in an inertial coordinate system, this object is accelerating down at 9.81. And then Newton's second law applies. Um, Have you ever thought, like, if you were in an elevator and the cable broke, like, what would happen? Like, maybe you could, so tell me if you've thought this or if you're, like, no, only a stupid person. Okay, so you think, like, so you're falling and say that you time it up just perfectly so that you jump off the ground just as the elevator hits the ground. Would that save you? Anybody want to see that calculation? Okay. Well, real world application. <laughs> um, I'm just going to make up some some numbers uh, that. That I know are sort of in the ballpark. Like if you fell, if the elevator fell, I think I think this is like 10 or 15, 10 meters, say. Um, let's say the velocity of the elevator. So an elevator cable breaks. Um, the instant before it hits the ground, the velocity, if we have the positive direction of our coordinate system, um, um, the velocity, I guess I'll write it as a vector, is zero, negative 20 meters per second.
Okay, if you're a good jumper, um, say that you can, uh, at exactly the right instant, jump. Uh, so you're capable of jumping on the ground two feet up in the air. That's pretty good, right? Um, so, and say that you time it up just perfectly so you leave the ground with that jump um, right at the instant that it hits the ground. Um, if you're a good jumper, your velocity as you leave the ground is about three meters per second. Okay, so uh, again, there's a ground, there's an elevator, and there's a passenger. Um, the velocity of the passenger relative to the ground is equal to the velocity of the passenger relative to the elevator plus the velocity of the elevator relative to the ground. Um, and we want to calculate the thing that we relevant here is the velocity of the passenger relative to the ground because usually I use ground to just say uh, as a stand in for like our inertial coordinate system. But in this case, we actually care about the physical ground because uh, that's going to tell us how fast we're going to smash into this thing, you know. And so um, the velocity of the passenger relative to the ground is equal to um, the velocity of the passenger relative to the elevator. That is your ability to jump. All you, when you jump, you're creating a uh, an initial velocity between yourself and whatever you're pushing off of. So this is zero three. The velocity of the elevator relative to the ground is zero negative twenty. And so if you time that up perfectly, your velocity relative to the ground is zero negative seventeen meters per second. And so you did make things a little bit better, but this is still, you know, the, the problem is that the elevator is going a lot faster than you're capable of jumping in the other direction, unless it falls a very short distance. Um, this is still over 35 miles an hour. So it's still bad news. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, or uh, going shorter buildings. I guess we always knew that anyways. Like that, like the building in uh, being John Malkovich, like with the little short floors. Um, okay, that's still bad. Um, all right, there's one more application of relative motion, rolling without slipping. Um, I'm gonna derive the formulas for this, just so you see where, it coming, where it's coming from. Um, using relative motion. Uh, you don't have to do the derivations or be able to do it. I'll just give you the formulas for this if you need to use rolling on a test or something. Um, so I'll derive um, but you can just use the formulas I get. Um, so here's the ground 
and here's a sphere or a wheel or whatever. Um, we're always, we're gonna assume that it's round. Um, it'd be a different derivation if you were gonna assume it was an ellipse or something like that. Um, and this point is C, the center. This point is P, that's the point that's instantaneously in contact with the ground. What physical point on the body is represented by P changes at each instant when it's moving. Um, the radius is R. And then we'll assume that this has an angular velocity omega and an angular acceleration alpha. And I'll use a coordinate system like this. With, then the z-axis is coming out of the page. And so if omega and alpha are both positive, uh, notice that the velocity and acceleration of the center of the wheel are both going to be in the negative x direction. And this derivation is going to be based on three assumptions. First one is that the velocity of that point P is zero. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. The second one is that the acceleration of that point P um, well, there are two parts to the acceleration of that point P. There's one that's related to centripetal acceleration, and there's one that's related to tangential acceleration. We don't know anything about the one related to centripetal acceleration, but we know that um, the part of that acceleration that's parallel to the surface has to be equal to zero. And these two things together are the requirement that says there's no slipping. Um, so as far as the velocity, um, You could have this thing moving up and down and that wouldn't be slipping. But uh, an object that's in circular motion like this wouldn't have a component of a velocity that's perpendicular to the surface anyways. And so notice that what this is saying is that if that point P, that physical point on the body, was moving this way or that way while it was in contact with the ground, you can think of that as like a definition of slipping. Same thing with the, the part of the acceleration that's parallel to the ground, um, it can accelerate up and down, and that's not slipping. But if it accelerates this way, that's like this point grinding against the ground, that's slipping. Okay. Um, and so this parallel means parallel to the ground, to the surface. And then the last one is that the acceleration of that point C that's perpendicular to the surface is zero. Um, okay, so this is perpendicular to the surface. And this is just saying that the motion of the center is 
is parallel to the surface. So if you had any acceleration of the center of the wheel that was perpendicular to the surface, that would be like the object popping up and down, sinking into the ground or bouncing off the ground. And so we're not going to deal with that either. Okay. So first, let's derive the velocity. And we want the velocity of the center of the wheel as it relates to the angular velocity and angular acceleration. And the relative motion equation says that the velocity of the center relative to the ground, you could do it that way, it would come out fine, but uh, velocity of the point P relative to the ground is equal to the velocity of the point P relative to the center plus the velocity of the center relative to the ground. What we want is the velocity of C relative to the ground. Um, the velocity of P relative to the ground, we said has to be zero. So it's not slipping. This is the one we want to calculate. And how would we calculate the velocity of P relative to the center? Um, so what we're saying is relative to the center means we're assuming our coordinate system is fixed here, like the center isn't going anywhere. And then you just had circular motion with an angular velocity omega and an angular acceleration alpha. And so we're just going to use the circular motion equation for velocity to calculate the velocity of P. So this is just going to be, anyone remember what the, uh, circular motion equation is for velocity? Omega cross r, yep. Um, and so zero, zero, zero is equal to um, what we're calling a positive omega is in the positive z direction so that zero, zero, omega, crossed with the r vector, what's the r vector for that point P? It's in the negative y direction. Yep, zero, negative r, zero. And then plus the thing we're trying to calculate. And so we get zero, zero, zero is equal to um, positive omega r, zero, zero. Uh, plus velocity of C relative to the ground. And so that gives us that the velocity of C, and I'll, now I'll just drop the ground because if you don't explicitly talk about what you're measuring something relative to, it's sort of implied that it's the ground. So the velocity of C is equal to negative omega r zero, zero. Well, no, I'm not going to drop it. Okay, so we use relative motion for that. And uh, in physics one, I'm sure you saw that equation at some point. And now for the acceleration. Um, 
So uh, the first thing we want to do is uh, set up a relative motion equation where we're only going to worry about the stuff happening parallel to the surface. Okay, so the acceleration of that point P relative to the ground is equal to the acceleration of the point P relative to the center plus the acceleration of the center relative to the ground. And all of these are only going to be parallel to the surface. Um, Uh, what what do we know about the acceleration of that point P relative to the ground? If we're only worried about the part that's parallel to the surface. That's zero. Yep. So we have zero, zero, zero. Is equal to acceleration of P relative to the center. Uh, plus the acceleration of the center relative to the ground. And with these, we're only concerned with the parts that are parallel. I've already dealt with that on the first one. Um, this is what we're looking for. How do we calculate this one? Acceleration of that point P relative to the center. That's okay. So I'm going to write the whole thing. That's the right way to go. So it's alpha cross R plus omega cross quantity omega cross R. Now we're only concerned with the parallel part. So which one of those two terms is parallel to the surface? Yep. So this one is perpendicular to surface, so we're ignoring that. So I'll rewrite this as zero, zero, zero is equal to um, alpha is zero, zero, alpha. Crossed with, we have the same r vector as before, zero, negative r, zero. Plus the acceleration of c relative to the ground, but we're only calculating the part that's parallel to the ground. And so we get zero, zero, zero is equal to alpha r zero zero plus the acceleration of c relative to the ground parallel part rearrange it and you get that the acceleration of c relative to the ground parallel to the surface is equal to negative alpha r zero zero Well, the full acceleration of C relative to the ground is the acceleration of C relative to the ground parallel part plus acceleration of C relative to the ground perpendicular part. But our third requirement, our third assumption is that there's no acceleration perpendicular to the ground at that point C. So since there's no acceleration of C relative to the ground particular, that's assumption three, uh, 
the acceleration of C relative to the ground is equal to negative alpha R zero, zero. Okay, so the take home message. Um, the velocity of the point C is equal to negative omega r, zero, zero. And the acceleration of the point C is equal to negative alpha r, zero, zero. And these, um, they hold for any problem where the x-axis um, is pointed along the surface. So if you have rolling happening on an incline, just use a coordinate system where your x-axis is oriented with the surface, and then these same equations work, even though it's not moving horizontally anymore, it's moving along the incline. Okay, let me do a quick example. Okay, so let's say you have a disc that's rolling up this incline. Um, omega is this way. Let's say it's two radians per second. And alpha is the opposite way. Let's say that it's Okay, so this is two radians per second. Let's say alpha is uh, five radians per second squared. And we wanna know what are the velocity and acceleration vectors of the center of the disk. Well, we're going to use a coordinate system where the y-axis is out of the surface and the x-axis is parallel to the surface. So z is coming out towards us. Um, then the velocity vector of this point c is equal to uh, what's the sign of omega? Yep, so zero, zero, positive two. Oh, and I didn't give a radius. Uh, let's say the radius is 0 0.1 meters. R vector is this. But that's in our negative y direction, even though it's not, you know, vertical. So cross this with zero, negative point one, zero. And we get a velocity of positive uh, doo -doo -doo. oh I forgot the negative sign 
Why am I even doing it like this? I'm going to use the formula. Okay, so the formula says the x component is going to be, um, so we're going to use negative omega r and then 0, 0. Omega is positive, so this is negative. Um, Two times r is point one, and so we get a vector of negative point two zero zero meters per second. So does it make sense that our velocity of the center is in the negative x direction? Yeah, if it's rotating. And then the acceleration of C is negative alpha times R and then zero, zero. So that's negative sine. What's alpha this time? Negative five. Um, and R is point one. Zero, zero. And that's equal to positive 0 0.5, zero, zero meters per second squared. Does it make sense that the acceleration of the center is in the positive x direction? Yeah, because for one thing, um, alpha is fast. The other way to think of it is this thing has to be slowing down if those angular acceleration and angular velocity are opposite signs. And that means that if it's slowing down, the velocity and acceleration have to be opposite directions. And that's what we got. Yes? That R is just, that's right. So the only things that need the signs are whether alpha and omega are clockwise or counterclockwise. Counterclockwise positive, clockwise negative. That's probably worth writing on here. Um, so counterclockwise, omega and alpha are positive. Clockwise, omega and alpha are negative. Any other questions? The vector r always goes from the center of the circular or spherical motion to the point that we care about. In this case, yeah. Okay, thanks. Hey, uh, you should all watch Evan on uh, on the news. There's, uh, you know, if there's, there must be a link on like Care Eleven or something. That was good. Yeah, Sue posted it on Facebook. <laughs>